Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. I think most of you know where the loos are now. There's, there's loos on the floor below in the steps at, near reception. There's also a disabled loo um, if you go out of here to the right towards the canteen across the other side. In the event of a fire, there's various um, doors around the hall and also the reception area. So just follow those through and we'll meet out in the street. So hopefully, but hopefully nobody will set that right, right to the venue. So I'll, I'll hand you over to Jan Roberts, who's going to open this afternoon's event. It's lovely to see everybody here. We weren't sure with this new format how things were going to go. And it's lovely to see some people that I personally haven't seen for quite a long time. So welcome to you all. Um, it's it's a, a new format and we just hope that this sort of thing will take off. And I'm sorry about the, the delays because the, the traffic was so horrendous earlier on. And I think it's due to the bikes and stuff like that. There were a few ambulances going past. We as trustees were all stuck in a people carrier for quite a long time and we weren't panicking, I must admit. And hopefully this will be one of the most successful first information day and then we'll be having some more. And the first speaker, it's all changed around and it's now uh, Dr. John Iayanu, um, the consultant rheumatologist from University College. Uh, London and also Lynette Forty, who are going to talk about living with lupus as a young person, which as we all know is extremely hard to deal with. So if I could just hand you over now please to Dr. Yanu. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation to um, talk about this um, this a, a subject that's actually quite quite close to my heart. Um, lupus in a young person. So I'll I'll talk about what it's like being a young person and being and, and, and how lupus may be different in a young person and also talk about the, need, the specific needs uh, of an adolescent and a young adult and and, and the health, how the healthcare um, should should address those needs and perhaps where the deficiencies um, lie sometimes and then I'll hand over to Lynette. Um, uh, who, who will then talk about her experiences as a young person living with lupus. Um, okay, so um, the um, age range for adolescents as defined by the World Health Organization is quite a, a wide range. It's between the ages of 10 to 19. So that's a kind of definition, the formal definition of adolescence. Um, and young adulthood um, is from the ages of 15 to 24. Um, and in most parts of the country, the transition of care between paediatric and adult healthcare environments happens at the age of 16. Um, in some other parts, it's a little bit older. But broadly speaking, it's around about the age of 16. So um, that's right, you know, almost about in the middle of adolescence, certainly um, it is, you know, adolescent development is still ongoing and it's just at the beginning of young adulthood. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. And what is norm, a, a normal adolescence? What is normal adolescence? Well, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that um, adolescence in young adulthood is the, the healthiest period in one's life. It's when one achieves peak physical uh, fitness. That's why you know, the best athletes, the best footballers are those in their early 20s. And it's also a period of immense biological uh, change that occurs very rapidly and very extensively. The only other time in our lives that we undergo such massive biological change so quickly is in the first year of our lives. And actually, pubertal development um, is quite unique to humans. There's no other animal in the mammalian kingdom that undergoes um, this degree of you know, biological development during puberty as what occurs in humans. And very importantly, is a time of um, life-changing events, watershed events. It's a time where a young person starts to develop their own friends and social independence, where they start taking important exams that can affect the next steps in their lives when they leave home, go to university, um, establish social independence, and some people start to establish financial independence, um, where they start to form relationships, um, intimate relationships with other people, when they first fall in love, when they first get their hearts broken. You know, it's a, it's, it, it's a time in their lives when their trajectory 
starts to become defined. Um, so it's an incredibly important life form in time, um, and it's the reason why the, our, 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 the memories that we have from being a teenager and young adult are, are so vivid and stay with us for the rest of our lives, because it's, it's a very important time um, in, in your life. Um, and we're only just now really in, 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 um, in the medical world starting to understand neuropsychological development in, in the adolescent and, and, and young adult. What was previously thought, and we now know this to not be true, what was previously thought was that the person, a person's intellectual ability and personality uh, uh, um, was fully defined at the age of two. So the brain was fully developed and then it's growth. But we know that's not true. We know that the brain um, dynamically develops throughout adolescence, right through into our early adulthood. Um, and in fact, the brain is not fully developed until around about the mid-20s. And different parts of the brain mature at different times in our lives. Um, and the part of our brain that, uh, that controls impulsive behavior, reward-seeking behavior, that's called the limbic system, that tends to be fully developed in early adolescence, around about 12, 11, 12, something like that. But the part of our brain that's the more logical part, um, that, that's in terms of that defines forward thinking, um, forward planning, self-evaluation, um, the part, the sen that kind of sensible part of our brain that puts a break on impulsive behavior, that's called the prefrontal cortex, that's not fully developed until the mid-20s. So, actually there's a kind of a disconnect for around 10 to 15 years during adolescent and young adult development where there's an urge for reward-seeking behavior, impulsive behavior, but the part of the brain, the brain that puts the brakes on, the brakes on that behavior, is not is yet to be fully developed, and that's just part of normal. And that's that's just and that, you know that's part of normal growing up. Um, and there's been a couple of studies that have kind of demonstrate that quite nicely. This is a study that um, looked at simulated driving in three age groups: adolescents, um, young adults, and adults. Um, and when these three groups are by themselves, um, the number of crashes were the same. But when in the presence of friends of, of, of a similar age, the crashes were much greater in the adolescents, slightly less in young adults, and in the adults it wasn't, it wasn't affected. And that influence of, of peers, that desire to be accepted by your peers uh, and to fit in, is such, a, is such an important part of adolescent and young adult development. It's normal. And then in another study that kind of illustrates risk-taking behavior, um, children, adolescents, and adults were asked questions like, is it a good idea to swim with sharks? Is it a good idea to set your hair on fire? And timed them how long it takes them to, to press the button no. Okay. And actually, adolescents did press the button no, but they did think about it for a little while. <laughs> so, effectively, and I think it's important to put it into context, actually. Um, being a young person is an incredibly important and unique time in your lives. And when you're peak physical fitness, when you're prone to impulsive and risk-taking behavior, and, and that, is, that is normal, that's part of growing up. Uh, where you form lifelong friendships, where you take really important exams that affect the trajectory in your life, you leave home, go to university, fall in love, fall out of love, have sexual relations. These are part of growing up. Um, and it's a very formative, formative time. And, and therefore, developing lupus um, is, you know, it is it can be a very destabilizing thing in the young person. Um, and we know of everyone with lupus, around 15 to 20% of everyone with lupus develops lupus as a child. Um, and we know puberty is probably a trigger factor. We know that it, it is a trigger factor um, in, in ways that we still don't fully understand. In, in juvenile or childhood onset lupus, and therefore the most frequent time in, 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 in which the most common time to develop lupus as a child is around about the, it's around the onset of puberty, around about that age. Um, and lupus in the young person does tend to run a more severe course um, compared to adults. Now, again, you still see that spectrum in young people. Some young people do have mild lupus uh, that can be well controlled with just simple measures. But there are many other young people with lupus that can be, that can run a very, what we call aggressive course, we have very active disease. Um, and in particular, young people are much more prone to developing kidney involvement. 
Uh, around 60 to 70 percent of young people with lupus have kidney involvement, whereas in adults it's probably about half that figure. Um, and there's probably more frequent involvement of the neurological system, the, um, the, the, the brain. Um, and the treatment for the, the drug treatment, uh, medical treatment for young people with lupus is, is, is the same as adults. It, it doesn't really differ very much. And, and the kinds of medications that we use in, in children, young people, are really exactly the same as those that we use in adults. Um, but the kind of the, the big one here is steroids. Now, of course, we use steroids for the least amount that we can for the least possible time. Um, but they're often necessary to control aggressive disease. Um, and they have, as we, as, as most of you know, this room, uh, lots of potential side effects. One of them is weight gain, which for a, a, a teenage girl growing up can be an incredibly difficult thing to deal with. Um, so, so steroids is, is often an issue that, that involves long discussions in, in clinic, and we, we do try to use the least amount that we possibly can. Um, and so lupus develops around this very formative time in young people, where they're undergoing through this, this immense um, change biologically and, and, and socially, um, and then just as they're getting established on treatment and starting to get the, to know their doctors, they have to transfer their care over to the adult side. Um, and that can be, a, that, that it, therefore it's a very important um, process um, to manage, to try and um, not destabilize things. Um, and that's where I think, you know, some, many parts of the, um, the country, the healthcare system actually falls down. Kind of managing that very um, precarious gap, really, between paediatric and adult care, and it has to be well planned. Um, and the, the, the challenges involves that kind of polarized, the polarized differences between paediatric and adult care. Um, in paediatric care, it tends to be multidisciplinary, with lots of different you know, nurses, as, as, as physiotherapists, occupational therapists, they all tend to work very closely together as a team, there's more time, there's often active follow-up, um, there's good psychosocial support, um, and it's parent orientated. And on the adult, on the adult side, it's very different from that. It's much busier. There's a large volume of patients. There's often much less time in clinic. It's patient orientated. It's very little access to psychosocial support. Small teams, um, and there has to be a middle ground somewhere that suits the young person. Um, and and in, in, in many parts of the country, still, that that doesn't occur. The Department of Health have published something called the Your Welcome Criteria, uh, which are quite recent, really, and, and define the, uh, what, what young person-friendly services should look like. Um, and, and that's available on the internet to have a look at. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that most adult units throughout the UK uh, fall quite a way short of, of supplying, of, of, of having services that are young person-friendly. Um, and the transition of care does have to be managed in a certain way. It has to be individualised to the needs of the young person. Um, we know that a young person that does develop a chronic disease like lupus matures a lot slower and has delayed maturity in, in many aspects of their development. The, the physician, especially adult physicians, and to some extent paediatric physicians, need to have a, 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 their own level of awareness in terms of dealing with, with teenagers and young people. They have, there's a certain skill set that's required, which I'll touch on later on. Um, there has to be really constant communication, active communication, and a work, good working relationship between the paediatric and adult rheumatologist, um, with a good flow of information um, across the two. Um, and if they have confidence in each other, then that, that translates well, and the patient therefore there has confidence in the healthcare that they're receiving. <coughs> And transition doesn't finish when they go into adult health care. Transition finishes when that young person is independently managing their own health care. And that often is not completed until they're well into the, uh, their adult health care environment. So for example, the kind of setup that we've developed in London um, over the last five years or so is that young patients with lupus that, un that are under the care of uh, Dr. Carissa Pilkington at Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, they um, Carissa speaks to me, and we're, we're, we work very closely together. And I have a transition clinic at Great Ormond Street Hospital, and a consultant there as well. And when the time is right, when the patient is ready, 
um, through numerous discussions, when they come and see me in my transition clinic at Great Ormond Street Hospital, I get to know them, they get to know me, um, and when it's ready, I then transfer their care over to a dedicated adolescent rheumatology unit at University College Hospital, um, and where we have a, a, a ward and a daycare centre that's um, specifically only for adolescents between the ages of 13 to 19, and we've got a multidisciplinary team there um, who, who's dedicated towards treating teenagers only, um, and when they approach 18 to 19, I then transfer their care over to a young adult lupus clinic that I've been running now for a number of years. And in fact, I can see many of my patients in here, um, which is great to see. Um, and I think that system works very well. And what's really important is that um, integrated into that is a, is a, is a specialist lupus nurse, um, Nicola Daly, who is funded by Lupus UK, and we're very grateful for that. And she, and she works in partnership with me, and she gets to know the patients at Great Ormond Street Hospital, works in the adolescent unit, and has a, her own young adult clinic that she does in partnership with myself, and she's the, the point of contact, really. And I think that system works really well, and we've had really positive feedback from our patients. Um, so that's, the, that's, a, that's an example of, of a system um, that, uh, that, that, that we've developed that I think helps support young patients with, with lupus, who are undergoing through these, you know, to, you know, negotiating their way through life whilst also having lupus. And these are kind of the tips, you know, for the I, I as a slide that I use in teaching uh, doctors that, 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 that may come and look on look people. Um, and these are the kind of things that we need to address during a consultation. And, and, and I'm not going to go through this list. Um, continuity of care being, I think, an important aspect. Uh, but it, it, it's an example that this list is, it kind of is it, this, you require a very dedicated skill set um, as a healthcare professional to look after young people. Um, and you know, it's something that I, I enjoy immensely. Um, but it's a skill set that actually, it, it's fair to say, is taught quite poorly in both paediatric and adult um, rheumatology um, and in other specialties. Um, and, it's, and it's a skill set um, that's different from paediatric care and it's different from adult care. Um, and I think the healthcare service is now rapidly recognising that there is a, a specific need and a unique need in, in treating young people with chronic conditions such as lupus. Um, and in line with that, um, there is also this recognition that there is a scientific void in, 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 um, in understanding lupus in young people because most of the research, um, a lot of fantastic research has happened in, in, in adults with lupus and we've learnt a lot. Um, but the treatments that we use in children is based on is based on the data that we have from adults, and it may be the best treatment for young people with lupus, um, but we're not certain. Um, so, um, so there's, there's, I think there's a big push now um, to involve young people more in research um, to particularly define what long-term outcomes are, because that's a particular area that our knowledge base is lacking. You know, what are the long-term outcomes of having lupus? What influences those long-term outcomes? And if we can understand what influences those long-term outcomes, then we can start to implement changes during, um, during childhood that can then positively affect them. Um, and we've um, set up a, a centre for adolescent rheumatology to study these kinds of questions, and it's the first centre of its kind in the world. Um, and it's funded mostly by Arthritis Research UK. Um, I think it's worth mentioning here that the UK JSLE Kerbal study is a, is a national study that's led by Professor Michael Beresford, um, uh, based in Liverpool, um, funded by Lupus UK, um, and is to collect information on, on, on all really children, the aims on all children diagnosed with lupus within the United Kingdom, and probably most children with lupus in the United Kingdom are, are feeding data into this cohort study. And if we can carry on collecting this information as they're going to adult and beyond, that this cohort study, I think, will be vital in allowing us to start to define what these long-term outcomes are and what influences one may see. So I'm just going to finish off with a couple of very brief plugs. Our, our, our centre, um, uh, we developed this website. Actually, it was designed by young people, and it's for young people. Um, and it has over 50 videos of young people with arthritis and lupus, many young people with lupus, uh, talking about 
their condition and things that they define as being important. Uh, you know, why me? You can I talk to? Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, I urge you to kind of, you know, to, to visit that. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's we've had really lots of positive feedback, um, and you know, from Google Analytics, it's been accessed already from many countries throughout the world. It's um, it, it, it's um, it's really taken off. And one of the one of the um, one, you know, what was apparent to me, speaking to young people in the clinic, was that, that sense of isolation, which Lynette may, 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 will, will probably touch on. Um, and the, hardly any of the young people that I was seeing in the clinic knew another young person in Lucas. Uh, and one of the first things that we started to organise, as soon as we got uh, funding from Lucas UK um, for Nicola, was that uh, Nicola, with Jane Damage's help, set up this young person's Lucas group. And it's been one of the most rewarding things in my career to see this really taking off. Um, it's, um, it's, I think a lot of young people have got a lot of support from it. Um, and it's, it's open to all young people from throughout the UK. Um, and those are the contact details down below if you want to find out more information. So I'll, I'll hand over to Lynette. And then after Lynette's talk, um, unfortunately, I'm, I apologize, I can't stay for the question session um, towards the end of the day. Um, but uh, so that we'll take questions um, after the next talk, and I'll, I'll, I will also be available at the coffee break if anyone wants to come and ask me anything. Okay, thank you very much.